Raising rent. As a landlord, you know you need to do it in order to actually cover your rising expenses and maybe even to make a cash flow for once. But you have great tenants and you'd feel guilty raising their rent and you might even make them unhappy and want to leave. So should you just keep your rent the same for years? Or what if I told you there was a way you could raise your rent and keep your good tenants happy? In this episode, I'm talking to a landlord who has just such an approach and we're getting started right now. Welcome to the podcast, Real Estate Investing with Coach Carson. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach Carson. And this is a show to help you get out of the financial grind so you can spend your time doing more of what matters. In this episode, I interviewed Dion from the YouTube channel, Dion Talks Financial Freedom. It was actually recorded on site at the One Rental at a Time event in Las Vegas, hosted by my friend and fellow real estate YouTuber, Michael Zuber. I wanna thank Michael for allowing me to use his awesome recording studio and for allowing me to share it with you. Now let's get to our conversation. Dion, there's a lot of topics I wanted to talk to you about, but there's one in particular I get a lot of questions about is over the last few years, rents have been rising, market rents are going up. I own an existing rental property. I have some good tenants. I don't want to lose these tenants, but I also want to take advantage of the fact that rents are actually higher in the market. So my question to you is, what's an approach that we could use that you, I know you've tried some cool stuff. What's an approach that you would recommend for somebody to actually be able to raise their rents and do it in a fair way, in a way that we all kind of get along and we keep our good tenants. So I I get asked a lot of times by people who say, I want to raise the rent, but I don't want to lose a good tenant. And the idea is if you don't raise the rent, you're going to lose a good asset. So uh, even Graham Stephan made the mistake. Uh, He had 10 rentals in California. He had 10 years with no rent increases. And eventually he realized he was getting a better return by cash sitting in a drawer than money sitting in his rental. So he sold some Mm. instead of raising the rents. And I think that there's a lot of times where tenants live in a property and a lot of fear that the new owner is going to come in, buy the property and raise the rents or kick them out and raise the rents. So they're actually living in fear. So what I've come up with is called the binder strategy. And this is a strategy that got me invited on Bigger Pockets. I made a free course on it. The idea is happy tenants don't leave and happy tenants don't trash your properties. So I call it the binder because I actually make a three ring binder. And most tenants, like I said, are living in fear of somebody buying the property. They haven't been paying attention to home prices or rents. They've been renting in a place for a while. Generally, what I do is I buy a property where the landlord was tired. The tenants haven't been taken care of. They haven't raised rents in a few years. They're not making money. That's probably why they're selling it. It's a lot easier to find cash flowing properties on the MLS if your tenants ask you to raise the rent. And so every time I bring this up, people say, well, tenants would never ask for that. They won't unless you educate them. So what I want to do is actually educate the tenant and have them be a part of the conversation. How many tenants have ever got to be a part of the conversation of setting their rents, being treated actually like a human? So instead of coming into a tenant and saying, I'm going to raise your rents $100, which would make me a jerk, I'm going to have a conversation. And and I'll use some exact numbers from ones that I've done. I buy a property, rents are eight or 900. It was a duplex, eight and and 900, so eight or. And after the binder strategy, both rents were above 1,400. So if I raise it $100, I'm a jerk, but I had rents above $1,400 after the 10-minute conversation, and the tenants are happy. Wow. Okay. I'm, I've got, you've got my ears. Let's, let, let's, let's unpack this. Let's, unpack, okay. let's open the binder. So here's the binder. First, first page of the binder is a picture of the property from Zillow or Redfin that the tenant can look up themselves. So you want to show transparency. This is information you can verify. You want to show the current purchase price of the property or the current estimate of the property if you've owned it for a while so that you can say, and the tenants don't care about this, you can say my uh, insurance and my property taxes are going to be based on these numbers. So your rents made sense to the previous owner, but it's going to be a lot more expensive for me. The idea is you're showing transparency. They don't care about expenses. Tenants don't care about your expenses because if they did, a property with a mortgage would rent for a significantly different amount than a property that was paid off. Right. And most renters don't know if there's a mortgage or not. So they right. don't care about your expenses. That's the first page. You open it up. The next page is a printout from apartments.com or Zillow of all the rentals in the area. Yeah. So that you, they can say, these are ones you can look up as well. The yeah. next page is going to be a printout of the fair market rents from HUD for FHA for section eight, what they will pay and how they update every year. This year, we've seen one of the largest increases in the last five years for section eight. So you're basically putting a bunch of, you're doing the homework for comparable rents for them, but you're also making sure it's something that's easy that they can look it up. It's transparent. It's transparent. It's on Zillow. You're showing it's on comparable something. rents. Yeah. You're doing it visually. This can be done through email because this works with Section 8. It works with, if you have a property manager, at a distance yeah. or local. can work in person or through email. And then you have several pages of the rentals in the area that have the same number of bedrooms and what they're renting for. 
So no tenant is going to come in and say, I want to go to area rents. I showed with this binder that I used, area rents were 16, 1650. I said, this is what I would get if you moved out. I don't want to displace you. I'd also spend five to $10,000 fixing this place up to get this rent. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to make you move. So you slide the binder to them. You actually give them the information of here's what section eight pays. If you're around a military base or a college, you can actually show what basic allowance for housing is for military members, okay. because these are comparable things. VAH had a 12% increase in 2023 and a 3% increase on top of that in 2024. Right. So section eight and military pay is raising all rents. Why would somebody rent to a civilian for less than they could get from section eight or the military? And you give it to the tenants and here's the magic question. What do you think is fair? So if a tenant is at 800, the rents in the area are 16, 1650. And I say, what do you think is fair? Now, remember, if I walked in and said, hi, I'm the new owner of the building, your rent's going up $100. I'm going to get flamed on Facebook. It's going to be a really bad relationship with that person. But if I go, here's what you're paying. Here's what I can get if you moved out. What do you think is fair? Yeah. They've never gone. Well, 1600 sounds great, but 1400. They're not quite to area average rents. They're a couple hundred below. That was a four or $500 increase mm. at tenant's request. Right. And then when I agree, they thank me. Now, I have sat some times where people say, I only want to go up maybe $100. So then you can literally put your hands on the table and go, here's 800, here's 1600. What you're saying is really fair for you. It's really close to what you're paying, but do you see how far that is for me? And the once or twice that that's happened, then they've come back towards the middle. So you never split the difference. You show them double what you want. And when they come back with somewhere in the middle or a little higher, right. you get a massive rent increase. And then I've had tenants so happy that I agreed to a $400 increase. They ask for a two year lease. So I have less likelihood of a tenant turnover next year. I get to keep tenants in place. I didn't have to do a rehab. I do do small things like put in um, motion sensor LED lights, put in coded locks, ask the tenant, is there anything here you want fixed? And it's never been anything big. It's been like, I'd like a screen door or the fan squeaks or something. Right. Spend a hundred dollars. Extremely happy tenants. Right. So 16 rental units in 10 years. I've had five tenant turnovers total. Most of my tenants stay longer than I've had the properties. Love it. I want to unpack the psychology of this because I think it's really smart. It is smart. It, this is a spe uh, specific strategy with, with tenants, but I'm just I'm thinking about how this applies to when you buy properties, when you're negotiating with private money lenders. There's, there's, a, there's a principle here, I think, and tell me what you think. It's the idea of, of, number one, having transparency. Most people, when they think negotiating, they're thinking, hold my cards close to my chest, keep everything secret, and then I'm going to go back and forth in some kind of like battle with you. Whereas it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's very... Uh, it diffuses a lot of that tension when you come up with a binder and you're like, no, no, let's just be transparent, put it on the table. That's, that strikes me, number one. And then number two, the fact that you're asking a question of someone when they've never, that usually it's like, this is what it is, take it or leave it. That's a completely, that's a big reversal. If I were a tenant in that situation, I would appreciate both of those. So I think that's a, it's just treating me like a human being. So I think that's what I would appreciate. So you're absolutely right with the first con comment. Uh, and this is from, I ran a CDL school for the last 10 years. Uh, if you don't tell people what you're getting out of the situation, they will think there's something secret. So you share what you're getting. What am I getting? I don't have to do a rehab. I don't mm. have to feel bad for displacing you. Yeah. And then we set the new rents. And uh, the idea for me is I was working full time. I, I, I made it to 40 without ever having $1,000 in the bank. I was a single parent with three kids. I found out about uh, $89,000 in bad debt in my name. I didn't know existed until the divorce got laid off from law enforcement because of the 2008 housing crash. And so I was working full time, raising three kids. I wanted to buy properties on the MLS and I didn't want to have to take the time to do rehabs. So it wasn't yeah. even the money factor or the, um, the, the lack of knowledge of how to do a rehab. It was because I didn't have the time. So if I could find a property on the MLS that needed minimal work, would keep the tenants in place, I would get rents where I needed them to. I actually talked with lenders and they didn't base rents off of current rents because of my strategy, right. because of how many times I've used it. They will base the possible rents off of area average rents when I go to run my comps on properties. Mm, interesting. So this is a, you've replicated this. You've done this a bunch of times. I've done it dozens of times. Yeah. Uh, I made a free course, uh, deontalk.com binder. It's free, I mean, literally no price. We'll put a link in the podcast and YouTube and, description below for that. And you know how much it costs to put a course together. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent about 10 grand to, and I want to make sure it's, there's never a charge because this helps the tenants and the landlords yeah. because the tenants don't get displaced. Yeah. They're educated part of the decision and the landlords um, get to feel better because they keep people in their home. Love it. Well, I want people to check that out. It's a free course, awesome resource. I, I have more questions. I want to dig into this a little bit more. Also about the strategy, but also just about your overall rental strategy. I've been, we're here at a conference with Michael Zuber and I've had so many people in the, in the, in the hallways are like, 
Yeah, you and Dion, it's like you have the very similar similar approach to your real estate in life. So I, I want to you, you mentioned your story a little bit. I'd, I'd love to dig into that and how what, what's your approach to rental property investing in general. We we see that you're you have a certain relationship with your tenants. I love that. I love that you, your tenants aren't the bad guys, and for tenants, the landlord is not the bad guy. This is a mutually beneficial relationship. I can see that as part of your business. But t- talk to me a little bit more about what your portfolio looks like, where you are, how you approach it. So coming to this Michael Zuber's One Rental at a Time 50,000 subscriber event, I was vibrating with excitement to talk to two people. I watch Sean Cannell often on how to grow a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, he's and great. so that's how I've, I've kind of grown my YouTube channel. It's tiny. It's like 15,000 subscribers, yeah. but it's, a, it's people I interact with often, all the time. I do live streams for two hours a week and answer questions. Yeah. And uh, what Sean teaches about growing YouTube, I've used in real estate. Like mm. 30% of what I teach in real estate is right from mm. Think Media's Sean's brain. Cool. And you. Oh, right. The small and mighty investor. So here's my phrase in the way I've said it now for a decade. I don't want bragging rights on unit count. Mm-hmm. I'm not looking for generational wealth. I actually think that's a mistake that people do. I don't want my kids thinking yeah. they have millions of dollars waiting as long as I pass away. That would not motivate them to be productive. Yeah. I want the right amount of cash flow from the least amount of units. And so I've never done a 1031. I've never taken out a HELOC, a cash out refinance. I've never sold. All I've done is worked. My, it was two years to starting investing, to getting the first duplex. And I had that bad debt. I started teaching at a CDL school and it was only making $17 an hour. So I had bad debt to income ratio. And I went to a lender and they said, we can't lend you anything. You have bad debt to income ratio. You, you don't make enough. And they said, luckily I heard this. They said, unless you had something like rental income on your tax returns. So I moved me and my three kids from our house into an apartment. Okay. Rented out the house for two years. I saved, I worked over, I played World of Warcraft and I <laughs> sold things online. I made like three or $400 a month in my side hustle. I love it. <clears throat> And two years later, I bought one duplex and started house hacking because I had the rental income from the house. House act with a 5% down, conventional owner-occupied loan. Two years later for another duplex. So this is very slow. It's boring. It's not sexy. Four years, two things. That's what it took to get two rentals. But then this thing starts to happen called the income snowball. I started making a little more money at work. I was working overtime. Uh, The rental income on the house had gone up. I learned the binder strategy. Uh, I was house hacking, reducing my expenses. I had income from the duplex. And where so are these, by one. the way? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. That's fine. I'm, I'm, all of my properties are in Washington State between Olympia and Tacoma, but not in Olympia Got or it. Tacoma. Okay. So I'm specifically outside of major cities. Yeah. Um, and then it was a year and a half to a duplex. And then I made a huge mistake, lost a million dollars by paying off a mortgage, bought a fourplex, house hack. My second house hack was a fourplex and then a triplex. And in 2022, I did a, a video on my, my YouTube channel. And I said, here's my cash flow. This is what I make an hour. This is what I make a day. I didn't really thought of it before. And then I sat down after doing this. Nine o'clock at night on a Sunday, I just finished working and did the video. And I thought, I'm making $200,000 a year without having to get out of bed. Why am I at work? A month later, I retired. Yeah. You know what? So much I love about the story is you, you mentioned those first two to four years. We've talked to a lot of people here at this conference is how... The psychology when you first start is hard. I mean, it's it's like there's you got voices in your head telling you don't you can't do this. You got all these you know sometimes legitimate excuses like hey you don't have enough money this is not going to work. You used what you had that moved to an apartment that just that strikes me. It's like okay I'm going to move my family my kids we're going to uproot ourselves. What what kind of motivation was there because th- there's always some sort of sacrifice whether it's small or big some discomfort you have to take. I'm just wondering for for people who are in that first stage there's something they have to do to get out of the inertia of what they've already been doing. What was going through your mind at that stage? So for me, I came up with six steps to getting financially free through real estate. And the first couple happened no matter what. Learning how to save, which means increase your income. It's not about decreasing your expenses. There's no limit to how much more you can make. You can only save 100%. Second is work on credit score. So whatever you're doing with investing, that's going to happen. So here's the phrase that I've used that got me through those first few years. You are going to be alive in five years. You should start investing like it. And so that was where the confidence came from. I think when I was 20, 25, and 30, five years feels like forever. When I got to around 40, I started realizing if I'd started anything five years ago, I'd be thanking myself now. So I made my, when I I retired at 52, because I worked, I reached financial freedom in eight years, worked for four more years because I loved the job. I loved, I got a job teaching CDL school, Mm -hmm. how to drive trucks. And I worked for those four more years because I liked the job. And when I retired, I couldn't believe, I, I can't thank myself enough for saying, those first years sucked. Thank me for going through them. Yeah. It's like a gift you're giving to your future self. Right. I like that. My five years from now, my future self is going to thank me for this. When you, when you first 
started looking at these properties and figuring out which ones to do, use the 5% down loan. Were there any other financing cash flow? You know, sometimes people say, how do I get the cash for the next deal? The next deal, was it just grind away, save the money? Was it being creative? Like, how did you get the money for those next deals? Slow and boring and not sexy. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, worked overtime, grew my side hustle. The house hack reduced my living. The apartment was 1500 a month. When I moved into the duplex, I was paying 300 a month. So that added $1,200 a month to my saving rate. Continued to work overtime at the, the school. Um, I had a couple ideas that grew the school. So I started getting demoted down. And eventually, 10 years later, I was demoted down to the president of the company. All right. Um, so they were all shocked when I retired because I walked away from $2 million golden handcuffs. And they have never thought about it yeah. because financial freedom means money doesn't matter anymore yeah. because it's just a thing now. Yeah. And so I would, all of my loan, all of my properties are from the MLS. All are with conventional lending. I've not done seller financing, yeah. no subject to. Um, I think subject to made a lot of sense when we were in uptrending market with downtrending interest rates, but that's not the current market we're in now. So it's not to me the one I would do. I'm doing my actual first burr now. Um, my, you know, you buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. I don't recommend starting with that strategy because you can really easily mess up your after repair value, your rehab cost, your timeline. It's a lot of moving parts to do it. I'm doing with. it now. This is my first and last birth. <laughs> so yeah, what's next? I, so I know I've kind of taken a diversion here. You, you, you have a portfolio of rental properties. You have the least number you need to have financial freedom. Um, we both have parents, you know, kids. Um, you know, what, what, you're having fun with the YouTube channel. Like what, what else are you up to? What's, what, what's the next five years look like? So I retired in 2022. Uh, Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time had a really bad day at work, went in at eight o'clock, boss said something he didn't like. And 8.45, he was on his way home, called his wife Olivia and said, I don't work anymore. I went into work and solved a problem that made the company a few million dollars, took four months to resolve, had a Zoom meeting with the state agency that was attacking us, turned them around to being our support. In that meeting, I asked the owners of the company, can you please stay? And when everybody else left the meeting, I said, I'm retiring. Because I was at the top of my game, had a best day, loved my job. I will always, for the rest of my life, have a good memory of where I worked. And so the last couple of years, I scuba dive, spent a couple months in Portugal. Um, I was going to be in Thailand right now, except for that burr that I'm doing. Kept me here. <laughs> That's why it's the last one. Uh, I like to travel. I have um, I go to Colombia, Thailand. I'm in, Here's the selfish thing I'm doing. Imagine being 40 years old, single parent with three kids, $89,000 in debt you didn't know about. Get laid off from law enforcement. Life sucks. Ten years later... Never have to work again in my life. A couple hundred thousand dollars coming in every year that I actually have to figure out how to spend now because I've been in such a frugal mindset. So I have reverse budgets now. Mm. I have to you spend, spend $2,000 a month going out. I have to have a car that's worth $2,000 a month. So my next vehicle I'm saving for, it's a truck I probably can't even imagine yet. So it's Maybe a very cyber, different cyber thing. truck. Is that what you're going to drive? I'm probably going to do cyber truck, but <laughs> jack it up, you know, 32 inch motors. And uh, if it'll move with those. Yeah. But I can. Imagine the emotional roller coaster of that. I can yeah. only do that once. Yeah. I'm not going to give away everything and repeat it to feel that again. Yeah. But every time I meet somebody that doesn't own a rental yet, doesn't know that your tenants can ask you to raise the rent, doesn't know that you can be an ethical landlord, doesn't know that financial freedom is possible, and we can get them on that path, and I can recommend them to your channel. Yeah. And, Life, and, vice versa. I, <laughs> and I feel every person that's here at the Zuber event, every person that's like, oh, I don't have much yet. I've only got two rentals. I'm like, that's more than 90% of real estate agents ever have. So I get to feel it over and over and over. And I, I kind of think that's why you're doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm inspired. Being a teacher is the ultimate high to me. Like I, I had grandparents who were teachers, coaches, principals. And I think, I think in a lot of ways I'm trying to channel some of that energy that I felt like they didn't get paid much to be a teacher. They loved it. They were passionate about the people they taught. That's the way I feel about it. It's, it's, I get a hundred times more excitement out of somebody I talked to and had a little piece of inspiration on their deal and they are successful in it. I'm like, yes, amazing. Or, you know, hearing about somebody five, 10, I've, I've now been teaching enough that I've had people who are financially independent and I coached or taught them when they first started. That blows my mind, but it's, it's amazing. It's like, I, we, for us to have this freedom and flexibility and to know that we're going to try to have other people hang out with us and do it too. Like that's, that's what it's all about. And what's so cool about YouTube and podcasting is that we can sit here and talk on a microphone and have some people come along with us. And I appreciate what you've done. I appreciate you sharing your story. I also appreciate just this idea that tenants and landlords have a mutually beneficial relationship here and that we, we, we have some problems we can solve in our society by providing housing for people, for 
solving problems financially for people and even turning tenants into homeowners so they can eventually buy properties. I, I like doing that too. So appreciate what you do. I, let people know where they can hang out with you and where, where you'd like to send them. You've mentioned the free course. I'll put that in the link below, but let, uh, where can people hang out with you after the video? So right here on YouTube, Dion Talk Financial Freedom. I do three videos a week and every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, I do a live stream that lasts as long as the questions do. Oh, good. That's, that's valuable. Okay, very good. So I'll put a link to that and people come check you out. So thank you, Dion. In this video, we covered how to raise rents when you already have a good tenant, but we didn't cover how to find and screen for those good tenants in the first place. So in my next video, I interview an expert on tenant screening who gives you a step-by-step -step framework for how to find the best tenants for your rental property. And at the end, I even give you a free PDF with my own written tenant screening criteria that you can borrow and use for yourself. You can watch the video by clicking the link above me here or by clicking on the podcast or YouTube description below.